Hello, welcome to another UTS Startups Confessions. Okay, uh, if I was looking that way for about two minutes before this video started, it's uh, our Wi-Fi is not working too well today, but thanks for joining. Uh, we talk a lot about tech-enabled entrepreneurship, and I think that's a wonderful thing because over time the technology gets better uh, and that enables different kinds of entrepreneurship. And so I thought it might be nice for a little bit of a change today to bring perspective on how tech has enabled entrepreneurship over the years into the kind of confessions that we do. So please welcome David. Thank you. So you'll figure out why this makes sense in a second, but bear okay. with me because <laughs> Like you've come a long way and you've seen so many things over time and locations of different tech enabled entrepreneurs. But this for everyone at home, please explain what kind of work you have been doing and with who. Okay, thank you, Murray. Um, I'm British. I started my career in, I guess what I would call digital or the internet in the mid nineties. Um, the One of the companies I worked for became a company that had offices all around the world. I moved to New York and did 10 years in New York. Then I moved to Silicon Valley and worked there for five or six years. My wife is Australian. I met her in London and we've been back here, although it's my first time living here uh, for three months. And that's what brings me to Australia. Uh, going into a little bit more detail on my background, I've been in digital uh, marketing or advertising for about 26 years, I remember, remember someone showing me the internet in 1994 uh, through a Mosaic browser and realizing, not having had any previous attraction necessarily to technology, but realizing that it was gonna change the world. I started working for a startup uh, digital agency who designed and built websites, taking brands online for the very first time in the mid nineties. Um, and then through the advent of these devices, um, but I was working in an agency, a creative agency, or a creative and technical agency, or creative, technical, and strategic agency, helping clients navigate the internet in terms of how their brand would be expressed on it. So I worked for, I started life as an account executive um, of a comp small company in the UK. It was a startup. I forget what number employee I was, but I was interviewed by the founders. I really liked them. I became the CEO of that company in... 2004, uh, that's when I moved to New York, and I was working for a bigger company. The company that I was working for was owned by a conglomerate called Omnicom. It's one of the biggest marketing conglomerates in the world. But prior to that, we went public on NASDAQ, and so I got to experience the tech bubble, the dot-com bubble um, from the inside, and the collapse of all the companies that were involved in that, which is quite amazing. Um, when I moved to New York, I realized that there were other types of organizations I wanted to work for, and I eventually found myself at a very traditional advertising agency running digital um, called J. Walter Thompson, they were, or JWT. They were one of the biggest advertising companies in the, in the world at the time. And I became the CEO of uh, North America for them. Um, and then after that, I went to uh, work for an uh, experience design or interactive design agency in New York as a partner, um, as an equity holder. And it was about at that time that I got involved in investing in founders and startups, primarily at seed stage or pre-seed, sometimes at series A. So I've had these sort of two tracks where I've been working for agencies and understanding brands and creativity and marketing and technology, and then also investing um, in founders that I like that typically have ideas that aren't even products yet. Um, and we can talk more about that, I'm sure. Um, my wife uh, worked for Meta for Facebook, and that took us to Silicon Valley uh, for five years. And it was really there that my experience and I guess exposure to uh, VC and angel investments became even more pronounced. And I've got a portfolio of companies that I either have invested in, I mentor, I advise, um, as well as some companies in the UK. Uh, and I'm looking to do something similar here um, and in fact, my wife was in this very seat uh, about a month ago, and Murray kindly invited me to come in and talk about my experience. Hello, Michelle, if you're watching. Uh, <laughs> She's and, not. <laughs> uh, feel free to put some <laughs> questions in the chat. Um, 
So take us back there because raise your hand if you were not born 30 years ago. Okay, so more than half the room. Um, that kind of tech enabled entrepreneurship back then. And I remember like when the internet was, you know, a, a terribly slow modem uh, with not much to yeah. look at. Uh, but for those that didn't have that experience, what was tech enabled entrepreneurship back then that you were enabling in the work that you were doing? Well, I think, and I, I think there are parallels to what's happening now and um, uh, what has probably happened over the last 25 years. But I think I realize now looking back, and I think it was Steve Jobs who said, it's only by looking back that you can sort of connect the dots of your career. That I was working at a point when the infrastructure for what we now call the internet was being put in. So taking a brand online for the first time meant showing them their brand represented on a laptop or a computer and the ad units that they could buy were completely different to how they'd used to be thinking about advertising. And so this was before these devices were even an idea, uh, let alone an actual thing. So it felt like in incredibly early days and yet everybody was really excited and the brands that I worked with then, um, this was a, a British interactive agency, so we worked with British Airways, uh, the BBC, uh, the Economist, um, and lots of other brands that people would have heard of in the UK. Taking them online for the first time meant persuading not only the marketing teams of those organizations, but typically the CEO and the, or the board members of the, why is going on the internet a good idea? So I used to put together lots of pitch decks talking about what the internet, what we thought the internet would become and how we thought that eventually mobile internet, as it was called then, would eventually take over and succeed desktop internet and that one day everybody would carry around devices. We had no idea that they would look or be like this. But one of the companies that we were working with was Nokia or Nokia. I'm not sure how you, how you say it here. And they had about 76 different phones on the market at the time when this one device came out that ultimately sort of tanked their whole business. But we could see in the early 2000s, and the we I'm talking about is the strategists and technologists and creatives who were thinking about how these devices if they became as popular as we thought they were gonna become, would change the world in terms of not just advertising, but change everything we do. And it's very easy to, at the time to sort of say, okay, well, instead of having a one minute ad on TV or a 30 second ad on TV, well, just that ad will be on here. But of course, the ad formats and the units that a website uses, used then were completely different and required a completely different approach to creativity um, than they do now. I was telling Murray before we started that I was talking about the mobile internet in about 2002, 2003 to a lot of our clients who were interested but thought that it was going to be a, like that either the technology wouldn't get there or that the, the broadband was, wasn't ever going to be fast enough for it to work in that way. And looking back now, it all looks sort of like a very connected process. But then in the UK, I don't know how people were talking about it here in Australia, all of the telcos in the UK were trying to own the internet. And if you think about who owns the internet now, it's not really the telcos, they're just the, the pipe through which everything gets passed. So the value has sort of moved sort of up and down the value chain over time. And now if we get to talk about what's happening with AI, I think we'll see a whole other disruption, disruptive innovation happening um, in terms of what's gonna be possible. That's the thing, you, you go back to those points in time and you can maybe imagine what that feeling was like, but then you look at yourself today and try and think, what are the things around me that I am not paying attention to that will explode? And that's a much harder thing to answer, like AI is everywhere, but that's already obvious. What's the thing that's not obvious as a platform for technology-enabled businesses? I think sort of you, you've reminded me that I wanted to talk about founders I've, I've never been a founder, but I've worked for many, and I've taken over as CEO at companies where it's, been, it's the first generation of non-founder management. And I, I've realized that I'm actually attracted to like the optimism and energy that I see in most founders. And having seen a lot in the UK and in New York and in Silicon Valley, I started to realize that there were common things or common traits that these people would have. And often their attitude was about what could go right. So they came up with an idea, and instead of thinking about what could go wrong, 
they started thinking about what could go right. And the infectious optimism that they had for their idea would bring on board other people. And that was something that I've sort of gravitated towards time and time again. And I, I don't have that quality. My, I'm too, my, I can't focus on one thing for long enough to, to say I could ever start a, a, a company from scratch, but I really enjoy working with those people. And it's about having an extraordinary level of motivation and focus and a belief. There's a very famous question that Peter Thiel used to ask all potential uh, founders when he was thinking of giving money to them. What revolutionary truth do you agree in that no, do you see that no one else agrees with? And he would wait for the answer. And if you think about that question and then apply it to companies like Facebook, because he asked Mark Zuckerberg that same question, or to the founders of Airbnb or to the founders of Uber, at the time that they had ideas for what their product could be, nobody in the world was thinking of that. You could say that there were priors to Facebook, there was MySpace and Friendster, but often being a founder is as much about motivation, dedication, execution and focus as it is about luck and timing, being in the right place. At the, you can have the right idea at the wrong time. So you can be too early or, or sometimes you can be too late. But to be at that absolute sort of perfect time isn't necessarily all to do with judgment. It's all to do with being in the right place at the right time and luck. So that's why failing um, is also a really important piece. I'm conscious of the fact I'm talking a lot. So no, this is good. And I want to shift more in that direction as well. So mm. uh, working with so many entrepreneurs over the years and in so many different parts of the world, what are the common things that you've seen in those entrepreneurs? Um, I guess the one thing that I think is not only common, but in the best founders, it tends to be a standout quality, is the ability to tell a story and to capture the imagination. of. Remember, most of the time you're talking about an idea. And even though you might have a deck that shows your product working, you can't actually put some, something in someone's hands yet and say, this is what the product is and this is how it works. So it's the ability to sell an idea. And there are obviously some people who are iconically good at that. Steve Jobs, for example. But the idea to convince someone that your idea is not only something that they can imagine using, but will become bigger and better than any of the previous ideas in this category before, or is in fact a completely new category. I mean, when Travis Kalanick was starting to talk about Uber, nobody wanted to believe that he could come in and disrupt the American taxi cab services that were in all the cities. In fact, they didn't believe it so much that he found it really difficult to get money to start with. But it was his, and, and whether you agree with his, uh, the way that he went about it, it was his aggressiveness in sort of meeting fire with fire that got him to build the company that he built. Speaking of fire with fire, there's one story I want to pull out of you as well. Uh, you were involved in launching BIN. Mm. Take us back to that moment as like before there was a competitive search landscape in the way that maybe there is today. So we worked for Microsoft um, and we were working mostly on their Azure product, so take, gradually taking things to the cloud, um, which is still happening. And they were trying to figure out how they could compete with Google in the search market. And they had an idea for a search engine we didn't come up with the name, but we came up with the idea for the advertising campaign. And the sort of the twist on the search engine was to call it a decision engine. That it wasn't something, Google was something that you searched for, Bing was something that made decisions for you. And actually, like by like, debranded, if you use them, you think you were using the same product because search is search. But the, making it a decision engine and, and using that as an idea to launch the campaign, and I think you said you remember the ads when they launched, hmm. it was a phenomenally successful launch campaign. And what sort of, I guess, the power law of internet economics is that once you have the lion's share of the market, it's very difficult for someone else to take it off of you. And it becomes uh, you being huge or being tiny in the internet is, seems to be the thing the internet wants. It's the middle that's getting hollowed out. 
and Bing eventually found themselves in the middle. And they're doing some, Microsoft are doing some interesting things now, I think, with AI and search. Um, but certainly then it was, uh, they were very much the underdog against Google search at that point. I hmm. also find it interesting, like, as technology gets better and the kind of connectivity of people gets better, the opportunity to launch something like that that gets ridiculously large quickly is now better than ever. And you see ChatGPT being the fastest growing user base mm -hmm. ever seen. Mm -hmm. Why did that happen now? Apart from, is it the virality of it or is it the technology? I think it's probably a combination of both of those things. And I think there's this, if you look back at internet history and think about the fact that, and this is attributed to Bill Gates, that we tend to overestimate what we can achieve in a year or two years, but massively underestimate what we can achieve in 10. And if I sort of date the internet from about the mid nineties, we've had, I guess, sort of nearly three cycles of those 10 years. And things are just getting, we, I think we, we massively underestimated, we, we overestimated in the short term, the difference that these devices would make. So in 2007, when this was, when the original iPhone was launched, it didn't actually sell that many units in the first year. It was only, I think, when the next second generation came out and also people realized that with broadband and social, it became a much more compelling product. But things have started to move faster. So the, I think you're, to your point about chat GPT, everything now moves at the speed of light and think ideas travel around the world so quickly. I mean, it, to, to make the, I guess, the comparison back to the, before the internet, I would have to either listen to the, the football match as it was being played to know the result or wait until the following day when the news would tell me what the result was. Now all of these things are happening in, in real time or if you're not able to see something in real time, you can get it a minute or seconds later. So the speed at which stuff travels and the speed at which ideas travel is, is phenomenally fast now and the speed at which new products and services can travel is phenomenally fast. But I think there was a cultural thing in there too with chat GPT because it's sort of, if you weren't in Silicon Valley and if you didn't realize how much investment had gone in to open AI and to who was, Elon Musk was one of the early uh, investors and co-founders of open AI. You'd be forgiven for thinking that AI just appeared out of nowhere, but machine learning has been going on for a long time. It just wasn't really considered sexy in terms of products and services in Silicon Valley. Suddenly there's this just sort of command line interface where you can type in anything and it knows it can sort of, it can talk to you. And so most people's first experience of using that product was one of sort of, it was like most of these things start out as toys. So the mobile phones started out as executive toys. I used to have one of these Nokia brick phones with the huge aerial at the top. And when my mum would phone me and I answered the phone and said, hi, mum, she was staggered that I knew who, that I knew who was, she knew who was, I knew who was calling. And it's because she was used to an older set of technology. But I think chat GPT and the fact that we prior to that gone through this in the US, this massive peak and then trough of crypto and blockchain. I think people were waiting for something to come along and a lot of money had gone into um, AI up to that point. And people don't realize there was obviously chat GPT-2 and chat GPT-3 before 3.5. And then they'd already had, they had four already ready to go. And rumor is that five will be out within the next four to five months. But I think people want to see where this technology is going to go. And I'm not sure we know the answers to that yet. I find it also interesting that Silicon Valley is this magnet for talent, this kind of machine that brings talent in from around the world and piles capital into it and creates interesting things. And now because of the kind of focus of AI technology in Silicon Valley, it's becoming a talent exporter. Does that make you think differently about the different places you've worked in and the future of them? Um, I think that there is a sort of, I, funnily enough, I asked ChatGPT Chat to compare 
Tel Aviv, the, the, the venture capital market and the innovation market in Israel to the venture capital market and innovation market in Silicon Valley. And they share a lot of the similar things. There's all, in these places where there's a lot of innovation, there's always a great university. So in California, you have a lot here. <laughs> in California, you have Stanford and Berkeley. Um, and there's like a similar technology slanted university in Tel Aviv. You have government initiatives. And for Silicon Valley, it was the 60s and it was the Apollo program. And that they needed a lot of new technology in order to get to the moon. And Kennedy had said, we're going to get there by the end of the decade. So once you start having this sort of specific measurable target to aim for, you know what you've got to do. The government are plowing loads of money in. You've got the universities churning out the best people with the sort of at the time with computer science degrees. And you have the, that attracts money. So the venture capital market was attracted to Silicon Valley because of these other two things. And those three things together form this virtuous circle. And suddenly as talent, looking around the world for where you could go and work and where you could go and apply your skills, if you have a computer science or a design or an innovation degree, Silicon Valley was the place to go. The same thing's happening in Israel. And the reason it's happening in Israel quickly is because of the demands of the military to put a lot of innovation into uh, military technology. And whether you agree with that or Israel's position is beside the point, it's really what, just one of the foundational formulas for it working. So uh, my question to Murray before we started was what components have you got here? How, how friendly are the government to innovation in Australia or New South Wales? You, you have a university that's like teaching entrepreneurship, so you've certainly got that part of it. But it feels like it's at a very nascent stage now, which for founders or would-be founders or entrepreneurs or would-be entrepreneurs is a really great place to be. Because would you rather be in a market where if you're launching a payments product, you've got 25 competitors? Would you rather be in a market where there's you and two others? Or in fact, your idea is so innovative that there's none. You're the first. It's a greenfield. So the opportunities here, I think, are amazing. Um, and certainly one of the reasons why I was excited to come here. But then there's a gradient where like the extreme end would be go to Antarctica or something and launch a payments platform. <laughs> and there's zero competition, but not much market. And that's a tricky thing in Australia, I think, is there's a tempting enough market locally, but not a like incredible market for a lot of companies. So it's in a kind of a slight danger zone. Yeah, I've always seen it as team idea customers. So who's the team? Because you've got to believe without seeing a product or a service, let's assume it's just an idea. I'm going to understand that idea through the presentation from the team. And if that team can convince me that they believe enough in their idea, my next question is always about, tell me about your customers. Where are they? Who are they? How many of them are there? And how quickly could you scale this? So if you're working in a market like just the US, forget about the rest of the world. If you're working in a market like the US, where you've got 300 million potential customers, your chance of the, a subset of that for your product or service is going to be quite substantial numerically. Here, where the population is 20, 25, 25 26. 26. Yep. The subset of that is going to say so we're talking an order of magnitude smaller, pretty much. So I, I don't know yet what that means. I'm not sort of under the skin of the market here enough to understand what that's going to mean. But team and idea and customers still has to be the way that you will approach or I would approach it in thinking about what I want to work, spend my time with these founders. Is this something that I'd like to invest in? Is this something that I believe in? Is this something that I could see? attracting customers. And it's obviously possible because you have this Atlassian Canva, you have this sort of small ecosystem of unicorns. Um, so it's possible. I think the question is like, what's, what's holding us back? Like, why isn't this a bigger market for startups and innovate? And I, I confess to not knowing the answer to that yet. We'll get answers from the audience in a, a private Q&A session that will run after this, uh, which will start to wrap us up now, because uh, every week uh, from 3.30, we run these sessions uh, 
the best pizza in Central. Uh, for anyone that's been here before, raise your hand if it's the best pizza you've ever had. Okay, thank you. Um, and wonderful pe people in the room. But all the juicy stuff comes out when the camera goes off. But this to bring <laughs> us home, um, we've kind of captured the kind of growth of technology over those 30 years. Mm. Do you think we're in a better place today when I can load up TikTok or whatever and run some kind of viral campaign that gets a whole bunch of people using my drop shipped e-commerce thing as one example? <laughs> Um, has it made the world better? It's such an interesting question because for those of you who were using the internet in the 1990s, the promise, it was such an egalitarian place to be. There was no, there were no huge companies yet. It seemed like this sort of just level playing field where any anybody could come up with any idea and create it. And for a period of time, it was an amazing, you know, capitalism hadn't really sort of snuck in. And so it was this great place where people could express themselves. And there were all these amazing ideas around music and art. And now, if you sort of look at where we've, we've ended up, we've ended up with these huge, and it's not dissimilar to other big industries, we've ended up with these half a dozen or so huge companies that have made their money from the internet. And in some senses, it's game over. I mean, will there ever be a company like Google in terms of search? I'm sure there won't be. Will there ever be a company like Microsoft in terms of software and, uh, and business and workflow software? I don't think there will be. And the, the power laws of the internet mean that you're either huge or you're small. It's like very, very difficult to make the leap from small to huge. And so, and again, if you sort of look at the if you look at the world through Twitter or X, the world's not a great place today. But if you looked at like when I joined Twitter in two thousand and nine, I want to say that was a fabulous place to be. It was just amazing. Like everybody was the conversations that went on. And now, and again, I'm coming with a, a U.S. mindset, but it's become polarized. It's become aggressive. It's become like I think. It's a really, um, you don't want to spend much time there unless you really have to. But of course, the irony is if you're in politics, if you're in technology, if you're in publishing, you, that's where everybody goes to sort of swap information and to find out what's going on. So there's this sort of dichotomy between it's really useful for certain small niche things. But if you look at the, the ideas that are being sort of promoted on there, some of it's not, not great. So is the world a better place? We, we, we talked about this question of like, if you could be born at any other time in history, including now, what would you say? And you have these people that say, I'd love to have been born in 19th century France or Italy and experienced the Renaissance. And of course the answer is no, you wouldn't. You, the, the best time to have been born is the time that you were born. If you could have only been born at that time or earlier, because everything, infant mortality, disease, healthcare, ability to, for children to live out of childhood and, be, and grow up, all of those things have become so much better. And yet we sometimes overlook that sort of stuff when we're looking back and thinking how good things were when we were young. So I'm sort of on the fence about is the world a better place? Um, I mean, you, I'm, some people are nodding or doing this. So you obviously have your own ideas. Um, but I'm an eternal optimist. And I guess being a founder or working with founders or investing in startups, you have to be an optimist because you have to sort of see, okay, I think this could be something. These people could go somewhere. This product could work. This service could catch fire and people could be attracted to it. So I'm probably not the best person to ask. <laughs> okay. I think we'll end on that point, on an optimistic point, because uh, for everyone watching at home and everyone in the room, uh, is there a chance that uh, now that you're back in Australia or coming to Australia and your wife is back in Australia, that you might be willing to work with some startups and help them figure out their strategies? Sure, that's, um, that's, one, of the, that's one of the things I've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, and I, I, as I said to you, and I think I might have said earlier, I, I enjoy, I, I'm not sure whether it's the sense of possibility or sense of, I'm certainly not doing it for the money because most money 
invested in startups is lost. So it's only the, you know, I think they, the rule of thumb is you need to have a portfolio of maybe 30 companies, but most of those companies will not return you any money at all. So you're doing it for just the adventure and the journey and the possibility. So yes, uh, on LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach out below and we'll end there. We'll cut the camera, we'll go into juicy questions. Please join me in thanking David Eastman. Thank you.